Hi, everyone. This is Judy Warner with the On Track Podcast. Welcome back. Today, we have a really great guest for you. I'm really looking forward to sharing my guest with you. And please, if you would, follow me on LinkedIn or on my Twitter, which is at Altium Judy. And if you would like to follow Altium, you can go to our Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn profiles. So let's get started. Today, I have the great pleasure of being with John Bushy, who is the Director of Technology for American Standard Circus, which is outside of Chicago area. And ASC specializes in um, both uh, RF microwave uh, circuits as also flexible circuits. But today, um, I want to talk to John about a new uh, micro ebook that they've published through iConnect 007. And I, this book is near and dear to me. Some years ago, I wrote a guest blog on Microwave Journal because so much, R, so many RF and microwave engineers and just engineers in general are being tasked with designing their own boards. And particularly in the RF and microwave space, a lot of these design, these guys are designing boards, haven't had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in a fab shop. Yeah, and, and they really just don't get a chance to be exposed to as much as we do, being a fabricator. And since a lot of the people at our organization tend to be a little bit grayer in appearance, uh, we all have a lot of experience. And the reality is, is we can share this with them. One of our most important jobs is being able to educate them, and that's really how I think of myself educating other people, sharing the knowledge that I've gained over the years, and just trying to help them out with their designs, because ultimately we just both want to be successful. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I know as, you know, I spent 25 years or so in the fabrication industry, and when uh, I had a stint in the RF and microwave industry, and it was like culture shock, John, like it just felt like a whole different animal. I, it was like drinking from the fire hose. Were you working to learn. with the designers at that time? Yeah, I was. Okay. And so it was like, and I felt completely inept at first when I started there to talk about laminates, about all of a sudden we were talking about performance instead of just mechanical dimensioning and making sure the plate sure, was Sure, we're just used to meeting specifications most right. of the time, and those have a physical dimension to them. And the right. reality is you start getting into this realm of higher frequencies, and you start to find out what's really important to these designers. Yeah, and I, I, I started to feel it. The more and more I learned, the more kind of stupid I felt, and the more I realized, holy cow, there are so many ways that a board shop could screw up. And there's literally <laughs> dozens of different ways we can manufacture the, liter the the same board. And the reality is, is we always have to try to manage any of the risks that the design presents. And certain aspects of certain designs actually will, will present problems or they'll complicate other features that are important to this, uh, the RF designer's ultimate performance goals. And so working around those issues is what is so exciting about this. It is exciting. It's it's really challenging and fun. What and um, what what was really stunning to me is to real get to the point where I realized, oh my gosh, we could be one hundred percent compliant to IPC standards, and still have something that doesn't and work and make I a mean, trash board. That's exactly correct. Because you know we were within tolerances, we did a little, but you know what? If we over etched and you know that circuit had a little too much under or over etch or whatever that the performance went to heck and and they're like no this is not what we simulated in our and we're like too bad so sad yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the ipc standards so it's, it's a lot more complicated yep. so why don't you go ahead and talk about sort of this is now this is a book I wish I had enough brains to write, so I'm glad you did. Don't, don't it, give me too much credit there, <laughs> Judy. So. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about sort of the, well, first, why this book? We, I just wanted to share the knowledge that I've gained, and I, I've had the opportunity and the great fortune to be able to work at several world-class fabricators, uh, poly circuits in my early days, uh, helped get Mega Circuit into uh, 
PTFE materials and, and now with American Standard Circuits. But in the middle there, I was also able to work for an RF circuit board laminate company at Taconic. Oh, you did. And so I, I got to work very intimately with the designers uh, in North America as well as Asia and Europe. So I, oh, that's it's awesome. the ability to be able to interface with what are some of the most brilliant people I, I've ever met. Uh, it just taught me so much. And when you talk about coming into something feeling completely ignorant, well, that was me a long time ago. And the reality is, is now I, I hope that I can share some of the knowledge that I've gained through all this experience. So, so since I know you've been at Taconic, you probably told me that before and I just wasn't remembering it. But um, let's just pause there for a second and just talk about composition Mm -hmm. of high-speed materials sure. because that was kind of the first place I started and the realization of you know with FR4 you've got some fiberglass some it's epoxy resin, resin, it's resin and glass and, and maybe fillers and nowadays, there you go so. and you're off to the races now talk about what high-speed materials the different compositions what what they are and traditionally high-frequency materials were generally all PTFE based uh, and what that meant in the early days is that there was very few flavors uh, I think everybody knows the term duroid or has heard it at one point in their life or another uh, great materials fantastic from an electrical performance standpoint but some of the mechanical properties were perhaps a little lacking and that's really the largest improvement we've seen in materials throughout the years is, is the increase in strength and dimensional stability of these materials uh, which makes it easier for us to fabricate because honestly if, if a material moves around a lot during the physical stresses that we put it through then we have tendencies to have registration issues or causes other uh, other issues within our manufacturing. Uh, the biggest change in the materials nowadays is the change to higher thermal conductivity materials. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we see the market going in respect to those types of products as the power levels go up and designs get smaller, everybody's got to deal with these heat issues that they've got. And so. I'm sure automotive is driving a lot of that. Well, automotive does too. Uh, that, that you, that's an interesting another realm that we're, we're talking about is the use of very high temperature materials in a lot of the underhood uh, automotive applications. Yeah. Uh, it's something we just get a little bit of exposure to, uh, but it, it's also a very interesting field. Yeah. Just want to mention to our, I neglected to mention to our listeners that we are here at Design Con in. Um, Santa Clara so if you hear some voices in the background it's because we're here at a trade show and so just wanted to mention that so uh, ASC is here with a booth and also rolling out hard copies of their book so yeah so the going back to the laminate side so I know from the RF experience I've had that each of these compositions of materials behave differently right? Mm -hmm. Like when I think of PTFE. Distinctly. It, and they're, yeah. they're completely different <laughs> systems. You know, when you go from the, the thermoplastics to the thermoset materials, both have their advantages. Uh, you know, PTFE is a fantastic material in that it's largely inert. It's inert to the effects of high frequency radiation. And uh, it doesn't change. And that's what yields the fairly consistent results that you get with PTFE materials. Uh, now there's the introduction of the, the lower cost thermosetting uh, materials that also have pretty good electrical properties and that, that can be a huge benefit just in the rigidity, overall dimensional stability and the fairly low CTE values. You know, At the same time, they've been filling PTFE materials for years in order to alter their properties and they've actually done a phenomenal job in bringing the CTE values very close to those of copper which is the ideal since every board, every layer is clad with some level of copper. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could devote I, you know, five th shows. This just is an interesting subject, yeah. and, and there's a new material that comes out virtually every couple months. Uh, right. And there's just a lot of good materials out there now. There is, there really is. is which is really what it's the really, whole key to this is. Yeah, which is really actually good for industry and great for designers, which, right? When they're Which is why when we get asked the first question that everybody asks is, what's the right material for my design? And right. that's an impossible 
yeah. question to answer on the face of it. But the reality is, is as we dig deeper and deeper into these designs, we can kind of get a sense of where their price sensitivity lies, what level of performance they need, you know, just, just seeking to go through the process and understand what their requirements are. Before we get down the road, if I, re- I had the pleasure of reviewing your book before it got published, and don't I, if I remember correctly, don't you have a chart there, or is it on your website, that shows, like, side-by-side side, all the different side we do. high-speed laminates? It compares all of the various laminates that we use, and actually, I had a, had a ex-colleague from that company that I used to work for uh-huh. mention that, hey, I, I left out... Uh, a few of the most recent materials, particularly in Europe. I apologize, Manfred. I did not know that uh, know, there Manfred. was these materials were released, <laughs> but uh, thank you for catching that, and I appreciate your insights because, uh, you know, again, going back to that subject, I've been phenomenally lucky to have worked with some uh, fantastic minds as well as fantastic people in this industry. Which I'm sure is an awesome asset for you at ASC. So, um, Okay, so give us a quick rundown. Again, this is a micro book. This is not a textbook. Yeah, and it was uh, never intended to be a, a, a treatise on the subject. It's, it's, right. it's really to touch on some of the major, I'm going to call them issues, for lack of a better word, because if we don't deal with them at the beginning of the design, they can end up taking what is otherwise a, a fantastic board and make it virtually unmanufacturable and this is really yeah. about dfm it really is yeah, it really is you know we we go into all the subjects obviously not every subject as it relates to circuit boards but from material selection to copper roughness to uh, choosing the right stack ups and balancing your constructions whenever possible uh, how does copper thickness play a role in the ability to be able to manufacture or to find fine lines and spaces edge plating, cavity constructions, thermal management. Uh, it, it touches on that wide variety of subjects, and it, it just kind of gives you an overview of what we deal with, what to be thinking about when you're going through this process, and, and hopefully it'll be an aid. Yeah, well, I, I can imagine um, that this will be a great sort of place to, starting place because i'm sure you get asked these same questions over and over and over again it is and the reality (laughs) is is we want it to start the dialogue right you know and we want to be able to put something in your hands that can aid you right now but also help you think about certain aspects so that we can work together right we've dealt with some designs that deal with basically a, a a composition of every circuit technology known to man in one board but since we've worked so in depth with this customer for a very long period of time we've ended up balancing out the performance requirements that they need with our ability to be able to manufacture right because it doesn't matter whether it's the highest performing smallest assembly in the world if we can't make it or we get 10 percent yields it's it's not going to end up satisfying uh the customer so yeah, and that's another thing I remember feeling kind of pounding my head against the wall. Like, you know, now that I'm on the EDA side of the market, right, there's such good, powerful EDA tools out there, and but they won't necessarily flag you and say, no, dummy, you can't. Yes, and, and you're right, and that's exactly what ends up happening. I mean, we've gone through designs where people uh, – expect to get a certain level of performance and all the materials are there the components are there and we find out one aspect was missed and you know it could be copper roughness oh we didn't account for that right exactly Uh, and that was you know hey i'm getting minus three db down from what i expect to be getting that's a huge loss it's almost double yeah so uh there's what you model, exactly. and then there's what then there's, you can. Then there's reality. <laughs> then there's reality. Exactly. Well, my friend used to say, "There's what you simulate, and then there's physics." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then there's re- yeah, physics gets in the way, right? And and then uh, uh, John Toussaint, who actually works for you guys, he his favorite uh, line used to be, um, "Physics trumps theory," right? Very true. Right? It's Very so, true. you know, there's just limitations so to what we can manufacture. So, um, well, this is a really, really great, great, uh, again, it's a, I, w- I wish I had the 
um, ability to be the one that wrote this, but I'm so delighted. I think it was, truly, I think it's a great service, not only to your customers, but just to the industry to get this information out because it's sorely needed. And to my ability, no one has really put this out in a, uh, you know, no, kind and of I'll public- be very honest. If Anae hadn't uh, worked so hard on this project, it never would, would have been realized either. So, uh, Thank, thank you, thank Anae, you Anae. for, yeah. for pushing on this project and driving it forward. I, I do think it will be helpful to a great many people. And who knows, maybe there'll be something addition to this in the future. Yeah, that would be great. And I know you guys have written one, actually, which maybe is another podcast series we can talk the about rigid here. Flex the rigid book. flex which is that is becoming more and more we're actually seeing the two integrated in some instances oh yeah like when i was referring to that one design that's exactly what we're talking about yeah it had ims flex rf fr4 multi-layer blind and buried vias and a flex layer right in the yeah right in the yeah middle. right in the middle and a metal core i'm sorry i left that out oh so. good lord yeah but, but a piece of cake exactly right piece of cake can't you give me, you know, $10 off that board, John? Sure, exactly. We're going <laughs> to deal on price now, but uh, you do what you can. And, the, and you know, you've got to try to make it. You've got to try to make it successfully, and usually we try to make it for a cost. So Of course. Like, people, not everyone really understands. I wish I could take every designer and engineer and they you know, would be like forced to go through board shops like five times before <laughs> you're right i mean we even created a tool for that called pcb 101 just to kind of give you a good overview once you start breaking it down and you think of the circuit board processing as each bath is in itself a process right uh, then you start to add up all the processes that the board is exposed to as it goes through the manufacturing operation when we get into some of these complex designs it might be going through 150 200 exactly. different baths right. or operations yeah and all of them have potential risks so absolutely it's yeah if people don't really you know we've come to sort of um take for granted printed circuit board manufacturing i think we're all impressed with semiconductors and their performance and sure, the blah blah the blah boards are dumb and they just boards are dumb are and they just lay there whatever except you know what unless that that board is made right those none of those parts work with you know high speed digital you have controlled impedance with rf it's dielectric constant uh, line width and loss so i mean you've got one or the other yeah. And now with the added dimension of thermal management, since people are becoming much yep. more, which is fantastic because it can offer performance levels that weren't even theoretically possible just, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, you know. So let's talk about where um, people can find the book first, which I think is on the iConnect007 website, correct? That's correct. And... Um, and then where can people find more information about ASC, John? They can go to www.asc-i.com. Okay, give me to that one more time. www.asc, that's American Standard Circuits, I.com. Okay, very good. So is there anything else that I may have not covered or asked you uh, relative to this awesome book you just put out no it's just uh all i do is just encourage people to give it give it a read uh by the way it's free we didn't say that (laughs) it's downloadable for free it doesn't get less expensive right it doesn't get less expensive so you basically just put in your name and your email and download it and it's a pdf right it's a yeah so it's a digital ebook and Uh, i'm gonna look over at an a just to get uh, a little bit of uh agreement that is in pdf form is that correct Excellent. Okay, PDF form. And um, here at DesignCon, you guys have brought a limited number of hard copies to give away, so I'm sure those will be appreciated. And um, and I'm sure once you start getting readers, you'll probably end up printing out more of those. But, um, well, thanks so much for your time. Okay, so now for the fun stuff. I'm going to ask you two fun questions, sure. John. Because um, first... What is your favorite techie gadget that you own? Wow, that's difficult. Like that you can't live without. 
well, I mean, everybody's going to say their smartphone nowadays, but uh, besides that, it's, yeah, I'll be eh, honest no with you. I, I, I always go back to home entertainment. I, I'm sorry. I'm okay, just, well, I'm okay, you just don't totally. Okay, yeah. do you have like a pimped out home entertainment system? I have yourself? a pimped out home. Okay, entertainment let's hear it. Let's system. hear the specs. I, yeah, it's got over a horsepower of of wattage. It's uh, considerable. It's got. 13 speakers it's a little excessive and most people <laughs> think i'm nuts when they go into my house but, but that's all right is so, it like a home theater like it's how, a home wait theater. how big is your screen uh it's only 60 inches i'm trying oh to, only I'm try, trying to only talk five feet i'm people. trying to talk the wife into the 80 inch oled but for some reason that uh thirteen thousand dollar price tag is just a little <laughs> steep so we're gonna wait for the price you better to come sell down a few a more boards there at yeah, afc before exactly. you get a raise exactly um, and my second question is, um, you know, I, I know you're not a printed circuit board designer, but a lot of us techie people have kind of interesting creative uh, hobbies and things. And I'll be honest, our... I'm the exception to that. No, I shouldn't <laughs> say that. It, actually, actually, I'm you know, a bit of a computer nerd, always have been. Uh, I used to spend way too much time on computers. I think I set my first network up at home to be able to online game with uh or at least network game with buddies back in 93, so. You're dating yourself. Yes, I am. I was there, but. But I, but I yeah. you know, you can't stop getting older, Judy, so. Shh, don't tell. That's right. Okay, I, I decided I'm going to start counting backwards on my birthdays. That's how I'm solving this problem. <laughs> um, okay, so anything else, or shall we wrap up here? Is there anything else you wanted to share that I might have left out, John? I think we pretty much covered everything, Judy. Uh, okay. I appreciate oh, the Oh, anything, um. In, is there anything of note that you guys, other than standing in a booth and talking to a whole bunch of people for a couple of days, is there anything else that you guys are bringing besides your book to this show that may be of interest to our listeners? I don't have any specifics that come to mind. I mean, the reality is, is this is what we're working on right now. Uh, we're bringing this effort forward and, and hopefully, like I said, people will find value in that. But the, the nice thing is, is, Along with Ana, there's our rigid flex expert, Dave Lackey, and myself. So when we come here, we try to bring some value to the people that might stop by. So Okay, so while I have you recorded on it, will you promise to save, send Dave Lackey back to Absolutely. talk to us about rigid flex? We'll, we'll, we'll round him <laughs> up and send him in here, even if we have to okay, great. tie him up. Okay, great. Well, John, thank you so much. and. Thank you again for taking the time and effort to put this book out. I think it's going to be of great value to the industry for certain your customers. And um, I really appreciate that laminate chart you put together, too. I wish I had that a long time ago. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank Judy. you and have a great show. Thank you. Again, this has been Judy Warner with the On Track Podcast. Please remember to subscribe and add us to your favorite RSS feeds. And we look forward to talking to you next time. And always stay on track. Oh.